In this video, we're going to take a look at some different work hardening models. Let's begin with a definition of what work hardening is. So work hardening, and this isn't actually how it happens, just what it is. So work hardening is when there is an increase in the stress level needed in order to continue plastic deformation. And we can actually call this the flow stress, so sigma sub f, this is the flow stress, and the flow stress is essentially exactly what we're talking about here. So the stress that's needed to continue plastic deformation. So this would be different, for example, from the yield stress, because the yield stress is simply the stress where plastic deformation first occurs, but if there's work hardening, that flow stress is actually going up. So what we're looking for then is a mathematical equation for the stress strain curve. And so let's look at a couple of models that might be possible. Okay, so the very simplest model for a stress strain curve simply looks like this. Okay, it's not very realistic but it's a possibility, and here this stress is equal to the yield stress. So a few things to note about this particular model is that the plastic strain is much, much greater than the elastic strain. So essentially in this model, we neglect the elastic strain altogether. This system is what we would call perfectly plastic because we are ignoring altogether the elastic strain. And in this model, there's actually no work hardening because the flow stress is not going up at all as deformation occurs. So this is our simplest model, the perfectly plastic model. We can take this to the next step by considering now the elastic strain. Okay, so the next level of complexity has a stress strain curve which looks like this. So we have some linear elastic region and then a plastic deformation. So like before, this stress is equal to the yield stress. And here we have some slope that's given by the Young's modulus. So the features of this model is that it does not neglect the elastic strain includes it. Uh, and this model is what we would call elastoplastic because it includes both, although the plastic region is still not showing any work hardening. Okay, so we need to add sort of another level of complexity, obviously. Let's take a look at that. Okay, so our next model for a stress strain curve looks like this, where we have one linear region and we have a different linear region. Okay, and although I have not necessarily drawn it like this, if we're going to model this as essentially linear work hardening. Then it is the case that E1 is much, much greater than E2. Okay, and E1 is truly the Young's modulus here because it's in the elastic region. E2 is really a slope. It's not necessarily an elastic modulus because plastic deformation is occurring there. So, this model is what we would call elastoplastic because it still incorporates both with linear work hardening, right? Because we're assuming work hardening happens, but that it happens in a linear fashion. Okay, so we're getting closer 
this still doesn't quite have the sophistication that we might like to capture the real shape of a stress strain curve. So let's take a look at one final model that actually does a much better job of capturing the shape of a stress strain curve. Okay, one more time here. So we have stress, we have strain. We could actually imagine this sort of in, in two different ways. One is that we start to see work hardening from the very beginning. The second is that we have some sort of initial stress level. So this is, we'll call it sigma naught. So on this one, sigma naught equals zero. On this one, sigma naught does not equal zero. But in either of these cases, we can describe this by the following equation. So the stress is equal to sigma naught plus k epsilon to the n. Now, a few things to note. Uh, first of all, this is true stress in this equation. When we write it in this way, this is the true plastic strain. Sometimes the equation is written without the sigma naught, so it's just written in this way. And in this case, then this epsilon is the true total strain. So uh, this coefficient n here, this is what is called the work hardening exponent. And depending on the value of n, that is what shapes the curve. n typically takes on a value between 0.2 and 0.5 in real materials. And let's see, the last thing is about this, this K. So this is sort of like the uh, stress multiplier. And K typically takes on a value in between G over 100 and G over 1,000, where G is the shear modulus. Okay, so let's just take a look at how these stress strain curves might turn out depending on different values of k and n. So here's a comparison of how this looks, and the axes that we have here are true stress versus true strain, and the true stress is in MPA. So these both have the same value of k in MPA, which is 700. The one on the left here has n equals 0.3, and the one on the right has n equals 0.5. What we notice is that when n is lower, there's a high initial rate of work hardening, but then that rate sort of tapers off. So with low n, we have a high initial rate. but that that tapers off. And when we have a higher n, we have a low rate, and when I say rate, I mean low rate of work hardening, but it keeps going. So in this video about different work hardening models, we saw that there were four different models possible which increased in complexity, and we ended up with an equation which lets us model stress-strain curves in this way using the equation sigma equals sigma naught plus k epsilon to the n. The last thing I will note is simply that both of these models here used sigma naught value of zero.